Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Australian Pollinator Week. And I'd like to start with um, acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we are all attending from today across Australia and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I personally are joining you today from Darug country, but I also invite you all to share in the chat function where you are joining from today. And that's to recognize the role of our traditional custodians have played in caring for and maintaining country over thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I am the, so I'll be the MC for today. today. My name is Lee Hanna. I am the Farm Technical Liaison Officer for Bee Friendly Farming, and I'm also, a, also the Project Manager for Powerful Pollinators. Um, so just a bit about Bee Friendly Farming. Um, it's a certification program that works with land managers to protect or to help protect, preserve and promote pollinator health. Um, and we provide guidelines for farmers and gardeners to promote pollinator health on their lands. So in Australia, um, well, so far for bee friendly farming, we have uh, over 40,000 hectares that have been certified. And that includes about 12 different industries. So we're super happy with that. So to become bee friendly farming certified, you really have to satisfy a number of um, criteria. And that is providing habitat, floral resources for pollinators, water sources and things like that. But one of the most important criteria is to um, for the landholder to practice integrated pest management. And that's what we're talking about today. So we have three wonderful speakers with us. We have Robert Spooner Hart. He will be our first speaker, uh, followed by David Madge and then Diana um, Lehman. So just uh, a bit of housekeeping. Um, I hope that these wonderful presentations will stimulate lots of questions and I encourage you to put those questions into the question Q&A function, not the chat function, the Q&A function. Um, and you put as many questions in there as you as you want as we move through each of the presentations. We won't be answering them during the presentations, but at the very end, we'll have a question and answer session. Um, so you can ask these questions to our fabulous present presenters. So I'd like to start, we'll start today's presentation with um, Associate Professor Robert Spooner Hart from the Sustainable Plant Production Systems at Western Sydney University. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm very pleased to be giving this presentation during Pollinator Week. And I'll be talking more about the principles and practices of integrated pest management. And you'll also sometimes hear it referred to as integrated pest and disease management. So I wanted to start, first of all, by giving you an indication as to what integrated pest management is all about and what it's trying to achieve. So if you have a look at this image, uh, in the background, you'll see Australian native forest. And that's what I want to concentrate on now. That's a natural ecosystem. And within that natural ecosystem, there are low levels of input. So there's natural rainfall and natural fertility and so on. It has very high levels of biodiversity. And as a result, it has a complex series of interactions. So this is just a very simplistic view, but it goes to show all of the sorts of interactions that might take place um, above ground and also on the ground and below ground. So this very complex web means that the interactions make a very stable system. And the stable system means that we can come back in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years, and assuming nothing major catastrophes happen, it's going to remain the same. The downside, of course, is that they're not particularly productive in terms of yield per unit area. If we look then at the other side of this, which is a, a little orchard, um, and it's typical of a, an agricultural ecosystem. The first thing is, of course, they're designed to be more productive. But as a result, they need much higher levels of inputs, uh, things like irrigation, chemicals, uh, labour, energy and capital costs. And the aim of the process is to make sure that those inputs directly turn into outputs. So as a result, the biodiversity is limited. 
it's substantially reduced. And that means that essentially all of those interactions we saw before uh, don't occur to the same extent. And that makes them a much less stable system than a natural system. And to give you the same example as we talked about before, if you walked away from this system after five years, 10 years, 100 years, it wouldn't look the same. It wouldn't be sustainable and it would revert back to more like a natural ecosystem. So the whole aim of integrated pest management or IPM as it's shortened to, is to incorporate the best features of those natural ecosystems into our agricultural systems so that they become more stable, but also they become more environmentally and hopefully economically sustainable. Now, there are many, many different of, uh, definitions of integrated pest management. Sometimes, as I said, you'll see this referred to as integrated pest and disease management. And for us, we're now incorporating pollinators. So it's integrated pest and pollinator management. But I like this definition because it says it's a common sense approach. And to me, that's exactly what it is. We'll be using all methods of management for control. So we're using resistant varieties. We're modifying a whole range of our activities. Uh, we're conserving and manipulating natural enemies. Then we bring them all together in a systemic way. So not systematic, but in a within a, an overall system uh, to minimize pest and pathogen populations. So we're not attempting to eliminate them, but we're attempting to get them below the level which causes significant damage. And pesticides can be part of that mix, but only when they're absolutely necessary. And they're used in such a way to uh, minimize or less interfere with these other non-chemical methods. Now, it's not a new concept. Uh, as you can see here, it evolved in the 1960s and 1970s as integrated control. And um, in the days before TikTok and um, Instagram and so on, there were some early social influences of IPM. The first of these is Rachel Carson, um, who was a marine biologist and wrote a very famous book called Silent Spring. Uh, the other one's Joni Mitchell, um, again from Woodstock, uh, where she wrote uh, Big Blue Taxi, and she actually talked about getting farmers to put away their DDT and leave the birds and the bees. So IPM is based on ecological principles. Obviously, it's absolutely critical to correctly identify the causal agents uh, from either themselves or from the damage. Continuous monitoring is a critical component, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Setting thresholds so that we have an idea as to, it's not when the first pest arrives or the first disease signs arrive that we have to take action, but knowing when's the appropriate time to undertake that. And they're integrated, as I mentioned previously, a whole series of strategies in a systemic way and intervening with selected chemicals only when required. So let's look at each one of these strategies in turn. So monitoring, as I said, is key to all integrated pest and disease management. We can monitor for pests and diseases and weeds, we can monitor for their symptoms, or we can monitor actually for plant stress as an indication of infestations. We can monitor the weather and the climate, and that will give us predictions as to when pests and diseases may occur. And we may base this on our historical data. Now, monitoring, as you can see, can be done on a small scale like me in the top with a hand lens, or it can be done on large scale, and in this case, using drones as a means of monitoring. The monitoring is not just to identify a pest and diseases occurrence, it's also used to monitor how effective any intervention has been after they've been applied. Okay, the second strategy um, is one which is looking at various cultural aspects of management. So here we're looking at, first of all, hygiene, plant sanitation, quarantine, and biosecurity. And many of you will have seen those farm biosecurity up on um, various farms that you might have visited. So that's very, very important as a starting point to prevent the entry of pests and diseases. Maintaining good plant health is also critically important. Healthy plants can resist pests and diseases much better. 
Selecting of tolerant or resistant varieties if they're available is also another means. Managing alternative hosts, uh, preventing carryover, such as the image on the bottom where you can see there's a mummified diseased fruit that if it's not removed, will carry over inoculum to the next season. Again, modifying the crop environment to less favour pests and disease. And I've given some examples here, pruning, changing the plant density, changing your irrigation system, changing the fertiliser regime, use of cover crops or use of trap crops can all be undertaken. Uh, there are some other management practices and this may be appropriate, particularly for annual crops. And this may be plant, changing planting times or changing harvest times. And the last one, which I think is very important in this context, is providing resources for the ecosystem services. So they are the beneficial insects of all kinds. And here we're talking about uh, remnant forest, uh, ref planting refugia or retaining refugia and floral plantings. The next one is for biological control. And biological control is using all sorts of natural enemies of exotic uh, pests or native pests. This may be by the um, introduction of natural enemies from overseas. Um, a lot of those become established and therefore become naturalized. Um, we can buy, there are now a number of companies, including the Australasian Biological Control Group um, that supply uh, mass produced natural enemies that can be bought and released. There are also ways that you can undertake strategies to conserve and support any natural enemies that occur by providing resources for them and reducing pesticide applications. There are again a range of um, physical and mechanical methods that can be adopted. And these include various types of mechanical devices, as you can see on the right hand side, a series of, of bands or traps that are placed on trees to prevent movement of um, non-flying insects such as ants or weevils up the tree. Uh, they may be various types of traps, such as a yellow sticky trap, uh, a light trap for nocturnal insects, and in this case, a uh, yellow sticky placed on tree trunks. Um, this is in a tea plantation. Um, again, to trap, to mass trap uh, insects. And of course, the last strategy is to uh, look at the possibility of intervening with pesticides. So strategically, this can often be very useful. Uh, it's not always used as a last resort. And just to remind you that just because a pesticide is natural or organic doesn't necessarily mean that they're any less environmentally disruptive as some of the synthetic pesticides. We tend to recommend these days narrow spectrum, uh, which means that they're selective pesticides. Now, the good side of them is that they target a limited range of pests and diseases. But one of the bad sides about them is that because they're targeting uh, a very specific targets in pests and diseases, there's more likely for the pests and diseases to become resistant to them. So resistance management is a very important issue in terms of pesticide use. Okay, there are some other chemicals that um, could also be used. I'll only just mention these in passing because David will be talking about this in more detail. So there are various types of communication chemicals, which we call pheromones, uh, that uh, insects use. We can synthesize those and use them either for mating disruption or for trapping them. Um, we can use other semiochemicals that uh, often are plant-based, uh, again, for similar purposes. We can use insect growth regulators. These are uh, synthetic uh, uh, insect hormones, if you will. And they certainly uh, are able to interfere with the, especially the development um, of insects. And then there are a range of oil sprays that uh, effectively reduce feeding and uh, other behaviors such as settling and overposition of insects. So what are the consequences of using um, pesticides and how can you make them less disruptive? So the first thing is, of course, to avoid where you can broad spectrum pesticides. The second thing is to consider how residual they are. 
the longer they last, the more residual they are, the more disruptive they are ecologically. We don't have to apply across an entire crop. So if the pest and disease isn't spread across the entire crop, we can spot uh, target. We can uh, use baits. So all of these are methods where we're not applying uh, through the entire crop and certainly not applying on the ground. Um, and the last one is that we can better time uh, not only when the applications occur, but the frequency of those applications. And that's particularly important during flowering, especially for pollinators. Okay, so people ask, I would like to be involved with integrated pest management. And certainly this is a strategy that's been adopted by all Australian industries. So what are the steps that I can take? So the first step you could take is just to improve your cultural and hygiene practices and then to monitor for pests and diseases to better time your pesticide applications. A more advanced stage is while you're monitoring, you may find that there are some other species present and these may very well be beneficial. So if you find that there are beneficial insects, then you can monitor them. You can then better predict the pest and disease populations and whether or not they're being effectively managed naturally. In this case, if there are beneficials, select softer pesticides where that's possible and undertake spot and spray applications, as I've previously mentioned. The third stage is to look at modifications where you can encourage um, beneficial insects and to discourage pests. You could release mass reared beneficials, so buy mass reared beneficials and release them. You could use enema pathogens, which are fungi which um, uh, attack insects. So they're diseases of insects. And uh, there are a whole range of these strategies which could be adopted. You could also minimize the use of pesticides by employing alternative strategies to pesticides. And I've mentioned things like trapping and mating disruption. And again, David will talk more about that. And the last one, of course, is to better design right from the beginning of the production system so that you design it in a way that optimises integrated pest management so that we're not having to do what I guess is commonly happening now is we're having to retrofit or regenerate um, what was probably not correctly designed in the first place. So I'm going to finish off just with the words of the pollinators and I'll let them talk for themselves. And I hope these are some take home messages for you. So with that, uh, I'll finish. Um, as I say, this was a, an introduction of IPM and the principles and the practices. And the two other speakers are going to be talking in much more detail about some practical uh, results uh, from the field. So thank you very much, Lee. Thank you, Robert. That's a fantastic overview of integrated pest management. Um, it's good to know, you know, what you can do as a, you know, a back just in your own garden, right through to our um, large scale commercial um, farms. So thank you very much for the overview. Now we'll be moving on to David Madge, who is an entomologist um, for the Victorian government's um, Department, I can't remember what the department was, David, sorry. We're currently the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action. Okay, fantastic. Right, They're always it. changing. They're always not, changing. Not sure for how long. <laughs> All right, so good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm working with the Agriculture Victoria, which is our branch of the Department of DECA, as we call it. They'll be talking about IPM from a, an almond perspective, so taking Robert's points and looking at examples in almonds. Um, and I'll be the information I'll be presenting is, is largely what we've gleaned from work in, in a couple of projects, one past and one current, looking at developing an IPM system for the almond industry. Um, and I'm presenting this on behalf of the whole IPM team, which is quite a, a quite a big group. What I'll be doing is basically running through Robert's points and looking at examples that are actually being applied by growers in the field in almonds or that we're currently researching. So first I'll look at now, we need to know who the enemy is, so I'll be a very brief introduction to 
the, the major pets in almonds. We have two major ones. So I'll be focusing on them and then going through the strategy through actually, like I said, in use or, or being um, currently researched. So just a summary of, of Robert's main points, and I'll be looking at aspects of monitoring the, the highlighted bits, aspects of monitoring cultural strategies, biocontrol, physical strategies, and a little bit on the chemistry side of things. So firstly, who are we dealing with? Our two pests, first one is almond carpophilus beetle, it's related to the carpophilus that people often see in stone fruit. Um, and in a nutshell, it lays eggs in almonds, they hatch into larvae, and both the adults and the larvae demolish the, the meat of the, the almond kernel, which is a valuable bit for the industry. Um, and then they develop through several larval stages, pupate, and the cycle continues. They have a fairly short life cycle, three to five weeks, so they can develop multiple generations in a season, which means building up large populations and causing a lot of damage. With carob moth, our second major pest, this is a global pest. Um, it attacks many crops, similar to Carpophilus, and that lays eggs in the nuts, they hatch into the larvae, and the larvae do all the damage in this case, and pupate, adults emerge, and that cycle goes on. Longer life cycle, so they typically have three, two, three clear generations in a season, and sometimes you can see a fourth one. And I forgot to say at the beginning, because of the short time, I'm not going to be able to go into lots of detail on any of the points I'm running through. What I'm really going to be doing is bringing up, just give you basically a, a highlights of examples of the different IPM strategies that are, are being used in almonds. The detail has to come in a different format. A couple of important points about these pests. They do not damage almonds until hull split. So as soon as the hull split open, they start to lay eggs into the, the split on the, the shell or the kernel if they can reach it, and those eggs hatch, and then the damage starts developing. So this may, or the, the new crop is available typically from the first week in January in Australia when hull split begins, and it's there, the crop is there until April or May, sometimes into June when harvest finishes, depending on the seasonal conditions. That means that there are about seven months of the year when both of these beasts need an alternative host to live in and feed on and breed in. In Australian almond context, that host is nuts in the orchard. So it's basically crop residues that are left in the orchard because not all nuts are shaken off the trees at harvest time. So those nuts hang around. Um, they get rained on, they get mouldy, they get infested by pests, they turn black and pretty horrible. So we call them mummy nuts because they're sort of mummified. And they will hang on to those trees right through to the next crop um, when it's ready to be harvested. And they can hang on to the, hang on the trees in some cases for several years. So they're, they're a constant resource for both of these pests through the season and from season to season. So there's a bit of a hint there about one of the management strategies. So looking at some of the strategies, monitoring side of things, and basically, I agree with everything Robert said, so I won't keep saying that on every slide, but yeah, monitoring is really, really important for, for growers practicing IPM. We have developed, uh, we've done a lot of research on the Carpophilus beetle because it's a new pest for us. So identifying the, the pheromone, it produces a pheromone that, that calls its members together. It's an aggregation pheromone and volatile um, compounds from fungal odors. So we have a monitoring trap that is is new we're just trialing that out this season to see how it performs and it's certainly pulling in beetles so we, we now have a trap that we can monitor carpophilus beetle with carob moth traps have been around for a long time because carob moth is the number one pest of dates in california so they developed a, a synthetic version of a female sex pheromone years ago and that's in a little rubber plug that is put on a sticky base inside these traps hanging up in the trees and by checking those regularly and counting how many males are caught growers can develop um, a good database on the, the, the pattern of, of moth activity during the season and comparing, be able to compare between seasons to see whether they have higher or lower risk of damage according to how the population is going in each season because um, there's a lot of variation, but also looking between blocks and between farms to see where the, the risk high-risk areas are. Nut monitoring is also important for us. So looking at nuts at harvest time, sampling those to see what damage levels are looking like and differences in damage between blocks. And that can give growers indi an indication as to which blocks they may want to harvest sooner and get off the farm and fumigated or processed if it looks like they're at high risk of damage. Monitoring of those those old mouldy mummy nuts during winter um, is also important. 
because that can tell growers a bit beforehand of where their high risk areas are together with the numbers of mummy nuts in the trees in the first place. So high numbers of mummy nuts in trees, high levels of infestation of pests gives them an indication that's going to be a high risk area for damage in the coming season. Uh, sorry, the coming harvest. Looking at cultural strategies, resistant varieties we usually think of as being bred into things like annual crops, but the almond industry has had a, a long-term breeding program looking at new variety development, partly to look at self-fertile varieties to reduce dependence on pollination in case we have issues like varroa mite, which is now here, um, but also looking at other characteristics, and they include um, better shell characteristics. The major variety in Australia has a lot of shell split when they're maturing towards harvest. So that means really easy access for mould, rain, caramoth and carpophilus beetle. So looking at developing varieties that have more intact shells um, and maybe even firmer shells will help to reduce um, pest infestation. Pest infestation sorry. A few other things that growers can do as far as um, cultural strategies and modifying the crop environment include things like managing irrigation more accurately to avoid wet areas in the orchard. Wet areas usually end up in more lush tree growth and kind of retarded or slowed down um, maturity towards harvest. And if those trees are not mature at the same time as the rest of the crop, they don't harvest as well, more nuts are left on them. So there's more food for these beasts to breed in. Um, simple strategies like hedging trees so that spray access to the tops of the trees is improved. Um, it's hard to get spray up there anyway, but having hedge trees where there's, there's open access for spray to actually get to those nuts on the tops of the trees helps in targeting sprays accurately. And another one I've clued in here as a cultural thing is, is timely harvest. Um, I guess it's modifying the crop in that it's removing it. So harvesting as early as possible and getting that crop out of the orchard and to the processing plant as soon as possible helps to reduce damage because as, as soon as the hulls split on the trees, from that day onwards, damage will increase until that crop is treated or processed. So harvest timing is, is pretty important. The most important cultural strategy for almonds is hygiene, and that's really hygiene to target the alternative hosts, as in the crop residue, mummy nuts. There's a lot of focus has been put on this in the past few years, where growers are basically doing everything they can to get nuts off the trees onto the ground, sweeping that into windrows, and picking that up and either pulverizing it on site to find particles that can be distributed across the orchard floor and be predated on by birds and ants or drying up or rotting to get it out of the way as far as being a food resource for the beetle and the moth. And there are strategies or potential um, strategies like new technology, like this mummy shooter from America, uh, which has diver been developed specifically to shoot nuts off trees. So it basically identifies mummy nuts on trees in winter and then tries to knock them off the trees with biodegradable pellets. It, it's only in early stages of development. If it becomes fast enough, accurate enough and cheap enough, then there's potential for that to be a real game changer as far as hygiene goes in almond orchards. And that would be a game changer for both of these pests because they really are maintained in orchards and supported there by crop residues. Um, so hygiene is really critically important for IPM in almonds, regardless of all the other strategies. And just touching on Robert's last point, I think it was about better design of cropping systems. I think there is scope for that in almonds. Um, currently, a lot of the almond industry, a lot of the production capacity is monocultural. So it's basically almond trees and dirt, and it's in large areas. So in the Robinvale area, there, there are numerous different farms there as in different company farms, but altogether there's a lump of about 15,000 hectares of almonds with very little other vegetation um, mixed in with it. What that means is that they're relatively limited resources for beneficial species, parasites and predators, and it limits some ecosystem services such as birds. <clears throat> birds can be really important in removing mummy nuts from orchards. If you look at relatively small orchards or relatively isolated orchards, quite often it's very hard to find mummy nuts in there towards the end of winter because birds have cleaned them out entirely. And what the industry has done by developing a monoculture system and big broad acre system is effectively designing out these ecosystem services, whether it's birds or beneficial insects, just because of the way the industry is structured. So that means also that there's potential there for as, as the industry renews itself and replants and, and puts new plantings in, there's potential there for actually designing ecosystem resources back into the system. 
And the more that is done, the less work there is for, for growers to be taking the, the workload from these beneficials and actually doing spraying and all these other cultural techniques um, if a lot of that work is being done by those naturally existing systems out there. Biological control has potential in almonds. It's it's limited in its benefit right now, I believe, because of those factors I just mentioned. Um, carob moth has a lot of natural enemies globally and quite a lot in Australia. And some of the, the beasts, or all of the beasts I'm showing here have been collected from Australian almonds. Um, Carpophilus beetle globally has very few natural enemies reported. So in that case, it's more likely that rather than having a parasite or a predator, we'll probably have antipathogens. And we're currently working on these for Carpophilus beetle. So there's certainly potential out there for the biocontrol bio for both of these pests and biocontrol in the classical way of, of predators and parasites with carob moth, but limited because of the environment that the almond systems provide for them. There are kind of relatively few cases where growers are really trying to maintain a, a more diverse system with ground cover, cover crops, ground cover, diversity of, of material, their habitat and floral resources and so on. But there's a real conflict between a system like that that would be supportive of biocontrol agents, so real conservation biocontrol, and the commercial imperative of having basically bare flat ground for nuts to be shaken onto and swept off and, and collected from for harvest. So that, that conflict may be solved one day if we end up with really high density plantings over the tree, shake and catch systems for harvest, not relying on bare ground, and then maybe the ground could be managed differently. But currently that's probably the big limiting factor in getting really good biocontrol systems running um, within orchards. The only physical strategy that we really have is mass trapping. So the same trap I showed you before for monitoring purposes, we are trialling that for the first time this season as an attract and kill kind of mass trapping system. The idea being to pull down the beetle population well before hull split comes along, and this is only for the beetle, um, pull the population down before hull split when the crop becomes susceptible to infestation. And we're looking to see just how effective that can be as an actual management tool. A similar system was developed for stone fruit years ago in Victoria. And when that's implemented well, that works very well. We're hoping this one will as well. On the pesticide side of things, um, a couple of examples here. One is a mating disruption one that, that Robin mentioned. Um, on the right-hand side here, you can see there's a like a bit of a, a putty, grey putty that's splattered on leaf. That's actually plum leaves. We did a little bit of a trial around the office. The idea of mating disruption is to flood an orchard area with a sex pheromone of the pest, in this case, carob moth, which confuses the male moths that have trouble locating females. And the idea is to, to delay and reduce the amount of mating that happens and so delay and reduce the amount of egg laying on the new crop and hopefully reduce kernel damage. That one still needs a bit of work in almonds because of the, the application technique and getting it in the right spot at the right time. But that has a lot of promise because it's basically a non-toxic, very selective approach to pest management. Growers are using their monitoring, their, their field expertise, their knowledge and their monitoring results to target spraying already. Um, so the growers who will only spray particular blocks or particular patches of farm where they know there's a high risk of um, pest damage based on monitoring results and past history of damage. And I've included the entrant pathogen here again. It's sort of a biocontrol, but we also treat it as a as a biopesticide because it's kind of when they work well, they're they're produced in bulk and marketed, sold and applied as a pesticide almost usually. Um, how it would be applied in almonds, we're not sure yet. We'll look, be looking at the actual application techniques as part of this program. One point I would make about the pesticide angle is that in almonds, where we're trying to protect the new crop and get a spray in the splits of the holes and the tops of the trees, that is very, very difficult to achieve. So there's, I think there's limited ability of pesticides to manage these two pests. And now the critical point, which I, I can't remember who said this, but basically when we apply pesticides, we apply them to ecosystems, not just to pests. And that's something that we really need to keep aware of. Um, when we spray almonds, we don't just spray carob moth. We spray the trees, the nuts, the ground, everything else that's out there. We, we spray the whole system and we need to keep that in mind when we're actually applying pesticides in any system. And pulling that all together, the aim of our research and the aim of, of what growers are doing themselves is to end up developing an IPM program, which is by definition a multi-pronged approach. 
where a whole lot of different approaches and different strategies tied together into a single system, um, as Robin mentioned. So in almonds, that might be looking at hygiene during winter, monitoring most of the time, applying mass attract and kill from early in the season for Carpophilus beetle, releasing biocontrol agents or, or preferably having conservation biocontrol in place for carob moth particularly, bringing in mating disruption if necessary, um, looking at health split fungicides, uh, sorry, health split insecticides if necessary, if, if there's years of really high pest pressure, and things like hull rot fungicides to try to reduce disease damage because disease probably plays a small role at least in getting nuts to stick on trees and we're trying to, to minimise that. And then coming around to harvest, and harvest as early as possible, um, getting the crops processed and stored effectively to reduce damage post-harvest. So an entire system of different techniques and approaches and materials and management strategies to give us the best result possible as far as getting a clean crop at the end of the day. And that's it. I'd just like to thank or acknowledge Ag, Ag Victoria, who I work for, and the New South Wales Department and SADI. Um, we're all collaborators in this project and co-funders of it, along with Hort Innovation, who's one of the, the main funders, and also the Armoured Board of Australia and Armoured Producers, who are very supportive of all this work, obviously, because we're, we're trying to kind of reduce damage in their crops. And thanks to the whole IPM team, which is far too many people to mention by name. Wonderful. Thank you so much. David, that, for that very informative talk. Um, it's a, I think, you know, this the integrated pest management and these large scale um, commercial orchards is very complex and hard thing to, to, yeah. to manage and implement as well. And it does take years and years and years of research to develop these programs. So fantastic work. Um, very exciting to see what you're doing there. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Leah. Uh, next speaker is Diana, um, and she is a research scientist, um, formerly working with Ag Science Queensland. Um, welcome, um, and uh, look forward to your presentation. And keep the questions coming, please. Put them in the Q&A section of the webinar. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Lee, for the introduction. So I'll wrap up this webinar by... Um, going through some more examples of IPM tools for a bee pest and then I'll put some little bit of um, time into talking about the difference um, moving from IPM to IPPM. Okay, so integrated pest management systems as outlined by Robert um, particularly suit a situation where you might have an insect pest of another insect. Uh, so for that we have this small hive beetle called Athena chumida is its scientific name this is a really serious pest of honeybees and native stingless bees. It's an ideal IPM target because it's very difficult to use insecticides to control an insect within the in, in, within the um, colony of another insect. So, and some of the damage caused by this beetle, it's um, the adults can fly into the hive and lay eggs. If the eggs get laid on mass, they hatch to produce larvae that also vector a um, they have a symbiotic symbiotic yeast with them that can start to turn all the honey and wax into fermentated mess. So you can have a very healthy hive of bees come back a week later and this is what you see. You see this um, fermented honey running out of the front of the hive, dead bees open up inside, all your frames are fermented, the odour is overwhelming, this fermentation of the honeycomb and wax and the, the honey smell, it's a sickly sweet smell, you see all these dead bees inside, you see masses and masses of these wriggling um, larvae in their slime and it's called a slime out, up close you can see the larvae and <clears throat> this is fermenting honey. Under ideal conditions to see the power of this beetle and the, the larvae, you can take a frame of brood and um, pollen, which is pure food for this, these larvae, and within seven days under ideal conditions of temperature and moisture in the lab, you can reduce it to just this, just a whole stack of larvae. And of course, if this beetle can get inside the stingless beehives, it can cause mass destruction as well. So it's a serious pest, and it's uh, particularly in wet years when you have La Nina, the estimated conservative value of losses in Queensland alone could be up around $12 million. We don't actually have good data on this. There's only some estimates in the past. So it's a serious economic pest when commercial beekeepers sometimes can lose two to 400 hives in one go. Okay, so when you 
when you're actually look at looking at strategies for controlling any pest, it's good to look at the life cycle to look at which stages you're best to target to see what the most vulnerable. But this is even more critical for um, integrated pest management because you actually want to have a very targeted effect, uh, maximum effect with minimum effect outside of, you know, so you, don't, you want little, little collateral damage. So the life cycle of the beetle is partly inside a hive and partly outside a hive. Adult beetle will fly into a hive um, when it locates a hive. The bees don't like it. They will um, pursue it and chase it. But the beetle can lay will lay eggs, little clusters of eggs, and not just one big large cluster per female. She'll lay lots of little ones all in crevices around the hive. Very difficult for the bees to detect. These eggs then hatch to the larva, which you can see from the previous slides. This is the stage that does all the damage. And But once that larva has fed and is mature, it then must exit the hive. So it's a vulnerable state now. It exits outside the hive and must find somewhere where it can burrow down into the soil to pupate. Um, and it has been known to be able to even uh, travel over 200 metres over concrete to find some soil. After a period of pupation, which is temperature dependent, um, the beetle it emerges again to go off and find another harm hive. So the sort of um, things that, so inside the hive, you can target the adult, the egg or the larva, but the adult was decided the easiest stage to target. Outside the hive, you can target the larva or the adult or the pupa, but the adult and the larva have been decided to be the easiest um, stages to target. Okay, so the IPM approaches for adults are simply using the uh, traps to, which use the behavior of bees and small hive beetles. So the Bees don't like small hive beetle, they will chase it. If they can grab hold of them, they're known to chew their legs off. So the beetles, the beetles it's a game of, of hide and seek the whole time. Um, so what you do is just provide a whole lot of little hidey places or harborages that the beetle can go into. Things like little traps you can hang between the frames and a honey and a hive, or a bottom board with a grated so they can get down. And what you'll do is put either oil or something like diatomaceous earth that um, is a some a, a powdery substance that will actually absorb to the wax and the bees uh, the beetle cuticle and dehydrate them um or you can use these fluffy mats they're mats that have vinyl on one side and they have fiber on the inside so if you use two of those together uh, fold them over it creates a perfect hidey place for the beetles to go into but when they go in there they get wrapped up and caught in the fibers um, and then another thing that commercially you have a cassette a flat cassette that is too thin for bees to enter, but perfect for the beetles to hide away. You provide them with some corrugated, um, some you know, corrugated cardboard. So you've got all these little tunnels that they can hide in. But if the cardboard is soaked in something like fipronil, then they they'll die on contact. So even though this is a chemical inside a hive, it's very targeted in that bees can't access it. But you could even take the card cardboard out and replace it with a very, very sticky substance. So that's um, a whole lot of options for trapping inside the hive. Outside the hive to do the larval stage. So once that larvae, the larvae move outside, they're quite vulnerable to a lot of natural enemies. And ants can be some of those, as can chickens and cane toads. But things you can apply um, in the IPM system are entomopathogenic nematodes. And as Robert said earlier, entomopathogenic just means uh, causing disease in insects. So the nematodes can be applied to the soil and as the larvae um, move around, the, the nematodes will penetrate into the larvae, release a bacterium that then kills the larvae and then the, the nematodes have a wonderful time breeding and you have this mass number that then emerge ready to find some more larvae. A similar thing happens with entomopathogenic fungus. This fungus is called Metarhizium anisopla. It's a well known um, fungus that is in biopesticides. And in the case of this, you'd have spores in the soil. So as the larvae burrow down into the soil, they contact these spores, which um, preferentially stick to insect cuticle uh, under little mo moist microclimates on the surface of the larvae, the spores germinate, they penetrate inside that larvae and they consume the larvae. They basically um, grow throughout it, paralyzing and killing the larva and then mummify it and then uh, after it's done that, the fungus comes back out, sporulates on the surface, which will add more spores to the environment for trapping future unwary larvae. And another approach outside is attracting is trapping the adults. So this is 
perhaps one that will work very well with um, with native stingless hives as well. So the beetles are using a whole lot of different types of odours that they're queuing into to find a hive. And beetles essentially, like most insects, they basically see the world through um, odour more than vision. They, they use vision, but they really see and detect a huge range of different types of odours. So if you um, pick out and this project here that I was involved in, we we looked at the odours that beetles find very, very attractive. And so we can generate them in a trap where we're basically just fermenting um, sugar and honey with yeast in water. And that will generate key um, substances like ethanol, esters and aldehydes, a whole series of fruity compounds that the beetle finds very attractive, including carbon dioxide. So you can hang these traps up to 200 metres away from the hive. So as beetles are flying towards the hive, under the conditions when they're really moving, then as they come to the odour circle produced by this trap, they'll get um, they'll, they'll get intercepted by the trap and they go into the trap and, and die. This project is actually uh, colleagues of David's in Ag Vic are taking this um, to another another step forward where we're hoping to have a more um, specialised trap designed or for small hive beetle, this is a general fly trap we're using here, and a specialised lure that can be added to the trap. Okay, so now moving on to IPM and IPPM, so from integrated pest management to integrated pest and pollinator management. That's um, This has been probably the last seven or eight years, there's been a move to IPPM. It's a recognition in the decline of pollinator species um, and abundance warrants that we now need to modify our basic IPM practices to include trying to preserve and increase the numbers of pollinators. So why um, what's why are we having to do this? Well, modern agriculture has led to a decrease in both the diversity and density of pollinators. And because when you have large scale agricultural plantings, which maybe have good economics, unfortunately, if you've got acres and acres and thousands of acres of just bare, you know, of one crop, then you've taken away a lot of habitat that would normally support a whole range of beneficial organisms, including lots and lots of different pollinators. So loss of habitat through reduction of natural meadows and bushland, all in our modern agriculture systems, disturbance of soils, because as we talk, um, a lot of um, pollinators actually have part of their life cycle in the soil. So if you're disturbing and cultivating that soil, then you're going to actually take them out and take away the habitat. The other thing as Robert alluded to was also the use of broad spectrum pesticides. Particularly if you're spraying at flowering time, you're going to have huge um, effect on pollinators and decimate them. So really, essentially, um, it's a common sense approach, if you think, and, and relating back to what Robert said, that really the focus of IPPM is to increase the diversity and density of populations of all pollinator groups in the environment. And what are those pollinators? To remind you that um, perhaps our dominant managed one is the European honeybees, but there's also unmanaged feral colonies of these um, delivering free pollination services in the environment. We have thousands of Australian native bees from the um, social bees, uh, which the native stingless bees, to lots and lots of different types of solitary bees. And we have flies, even our Musca domestica, uh, the common old house fly. I've seen it covered in pollen, pollinating some cactus plants. Hoverflies, another group, beetles, um, a lot of beetles, pollen beetles that specifically work to pollinate flowers. We also have lots of butterflies and moths. Now, the key thing with all of these is all of these different insects, they're quite different in their life cycles. So they require very different environments, microhabitats. Some will be in the soil. A lot of our solitary bees in Australia, actually, um, they, they're in the soil. And I think Robert had a couple of lovely photographs of a solitary bee coming out of its little burrow in the soil. So they'll, they'll have a wide range and sometimes it might be um, like reeds, sometimes it might be slightly decayed timber, it might be small branches, it might be litter, it, a lot of things. So the message is you have a wide range of different types of pollinators, then you're going to need a wide range of different micro habitats for them, to, for them to breed. So the key practices then and around um, IPPM really, I guess, make a lot of sense if you just think about the picture. Um, it's about agro-ecosystem agri diversity and habitat modification. 
this could be something as simply as diversifying your garden through your agricultural fields by protecting and restoring natural habitats. So you're leaving uh, amounts of natural habitat along the side of your um, your fields. It could all even be planting up meadows. So you've got bounds of bands of meadows in between your production systems so that you're providing food and different habitats within those meadows for a wide range of pollinators. So essentially you're trying to go from uniformity to the diversity. And Robert talked about uh, pest resistant pollinator crop, attractive crop cultivars. That's going to be different depending on what your crop is. Um, pollinator friendly cultural practices, Robert alluded to that as well. Uh, pollinator friendly cultural practices, the old time practice of always uh, planting flowers in your vegetable garden is simply that, to be able to bring in lots of pollinators into your vegetable garden. And the other thing in cultural practice is being aware of low till, because if you have high till um, digging up the soil constantly, high tillage, you're going to take away all of that habitat that your, your soil breeding um, poll pollinators need. And of course, all the other standard IPM practices that were already very well outlined by both David and, and um, Robert are also used in this. So the question might be, then a bit of confusion, what type of um, pollinators, what type of flowers do I need? What type of pollinators in my local area? Well, this is where I can get a little bit of cross-pollination within the Wing Bee Foundation programs. There is another uh, program called Powerful Pollinators in which um, a large number now of guides, and they're basically eight-page guides in a brochure, have been put together to give you a wide amount of information all about uh, what you can plant and in your specific areas. It gives you a lot more information on pollinators, the different groups of pollinators, the ecology. Um, so I will urge you to visit Wing Bee Foundation and look for power pollinators because these brochures can be downloaded, but you can also buy them. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. This is the end of my section. Thank you so much, Diana. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I guess all of those last points that you were tying in um, to the power, uh, integrated pest and pollinator management, really um, that ties in nicely with what we're doing and what we're trying to do as Bee Friendly Farming Certified. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the criteria to be certified is having those floral resources available. So or not just you can have your crop flower floral resources, but extra crop floral resources that are flowering um, either during the pollination period or outside the pollination period. So we want flowers available throughout the year to supply a diversity of pollen and nectar for our pollinators. Um, yeah, having habitat. So for ground nesting bees, we've got our 2000, over 2000 species of native bees in Australia. So areas for them to nest in the ground that can be bare areas or patchy soil. Um, also having Again, for the cavity nesting bees that will nest in twigs and, and branches um, of uh, often of dead plant material. And then, of course, for our very few, I think we've only got 11 species of stingless bees in Australia. So, um, yeah, having open cavities in, it, it, uh, within, you know, old stumps or within tree trunks and things like that. So, um, yes, absolutely wonderful. Thank you for your time. I just want to point out that um, all of three of our presenters are doing this off their own of their own time so we really appreciate your time and expertise um and i'll go with a couple of questions so um this one would be for you diana um where or, or robert uh where do you buy the mats for inside uh for the for the small hive beetle the trap mats <laughs> do you want me to answer yeah. um yeah. It's it's simply they're actually sold as um like tabletop protector from somewhere like Spotlight. I mean sometimes Aldi actually sells a pack a couple of times a year. So it's really vinyl with a, a woven um furry bit underneath. And I I mean the vinyl is important because you don't want bees getting caught up. So you buy enough to fold over to fit in the top of your hive. It also serves to prevent burr comb. So it's sort of like this double thing. So um, I'm pretty certain you'll find that your local spotlight store will sell it by the meter. Uh, I think maybe Lincraft might also do that too. So. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie said, thanks for all the speakers and the informative presentations. The topics were fascinating. I learned a lot. Thank you so much for that, Stephanie. Um, so there's another question. Uh, is there funding for introducing small meadow flowers 
for small holdings of private individuals? Look, I'll answer that. I mean, as part of, so there's the sort of a couple of processes we've got. So we've, Wayne Bee Foundation actually do uh, working with different um, organisations uh, just, just for exactly that. So at the moment, oh, I think we've just closed. Um, we had Carmen's Trees for Bees. So that was for community, more for community groups and whatnot that they could get small grants um, for, you know, schools or um community hubs and things like that. We also have, um, we have four Bee Friendly Farming certified members. So this is on the, you know, the larger scale. Um, we've linked up with um, One Tree Planted. Um, and so this is a program where um, we will reimburse landholders $1 for every tree that they put in um, and have to go through a various application process. So we're always coming up with these sorts of things. Uh, keep an eye out, go to our website, weanbeefoundation.org.au. Um, I hope that helps answer that. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Anita. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering, I just had a question maybe for you, David. Um, just in regard to the pheromones, I find it really fascinating because um, I think you were talking, maybe you did explain it in the in the um in your presentation. But like you know, is it you said it's really just targeting one insect species? So if you're you so obviously when you talk about pheromones, you're looking at the the sex pheromone that a female will emit, and that attracts a male. The male will come and find the female. So how it, if you isolate that pheromone, does that cover other different species? Like can different species have the same pheromone attraction? It, it varies a little bit. So with with carob moth, they, they tend to be specific because obviously when, when a moth or a beetle are out on the field and they female wants to release a pheromone to attract a male, they want to attract the male of that species. Okay, yeah. So sex pheromones tend to be fairly specific. Yeah. With So with carob moth, the mating disruption and the trapping um, pheromone plugs are based on a synthetic version of the female sex pheromone and you get carob moth largely, but occasionally you do get other moths just flying into the traps by accident. And okay. sometimes there can be a little bit of cross attraction, but not much with sex pheromones. Carpophilus beetle, it's a different matter. The pheromone is an aggregation pheromone, so it attracts male and female. Mm -hmm. And basically that is only released when the beetles, adult beetles, fly around, find a good food source. And they say they release an aggregation pheromone. They say, hey, everyone else, come on here. I've got a good food source here. And then when the population density around that food source gets to a certain point, they cut out the pheromone production because they don't want too many coming in at once. Yeah. There is, and, it, and each species of Carpophilus will release an aggregation pheromone, and there is, they're generally, they're more targeted to their own species, but there is some cross-attraction. Yes. So if you have, like with the work that was done in stone fruit, there were three different species or pheromones from three different species put in the traps for stone fruit because they had several species going for stone fruit causing damage. And we did get some of our Carpophilus truncatus, the almond beetle, in those traps because the mix of pheromones is a little bit of cross-attraction with other species, but generally they're, the bulk of what they attract is that particular species. That's so with this particular one, now that we've got the pheromone sorted out and the pheromone blend working, with our traps, and we, we're checking them, we, we last season we had a big trapping trial and we're getting about average 98% was just this one species and a few bits and pieces of others. So this is quite specific. Yeah, and a really nice example of integrated pest management. Yeah. Robert, yeah. What, just just from a, I was just thinking from, you know, for our bee friendly farming members, you know, we have properties from that are half a uh, acre right up to 4,000 hectares. Um, if you are a smaller property owner, so a gardener, or you've got a hobby farm, or you're just starting to starting out, what 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 are some sort of maybe two or three points that um, a beginner could do to start um, practicing integrated pest management? Um, look, Lee, that's a that's an interesting question, and I guess there's a there's a broader issue, um, and David sort of alluded to it a bit, um, where you've got monocultures here where you've got many different farms producing the same thing there's not much point in one individual group saying yes we're going to do pheromones mm -hmm. um you know the moths will fly in and out irrespective of whether you've got pheromones you'll have mated moths moving in and out so the idea of actually looking at a an area-wide program where everybody is doing it 
Mm -hmm. everybody's following the same practice. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be realistic because most of the species we're talking about are going to fly bigger distances than just onto your own property. Mm -hmm. So um, we've, we've got to think, okay, what sort of strategies can we use? Certainly, and I've listed them, most important thing is to monitor. Okay, that way you'll know very early in the piece. It doesn't mean you need to panic. You don't need to, first time you see something, you don't need to spray. Um, but the whole idea, I think, of the monitoring is to give people a degree of confidence in their own ability to manage. And that's it's that really, to me, is probably the most important thing about integrated pest management. It's about you taking control and you being in charge. Um, if you do the other way, which is just waiting for, uh, you know, somebody to tell you what to spray, or you just go out and spray irrespective, just in case there's a problem, then, you know, that's not what we're talking about here. So on a small scale, certainly. Um, the other one is, uh, and we've talked about the issue of biosecurity. So it's very, very important if you don't have a pest, that may be carried in by other people or by vehicles, that you actually have an area where people park. Um, you might need to tell them, okay, if you've been to another property, have you disinfested the vehicle, for example? I mean, places that use um, various types of implements, um, often they may have come from a farm uh, where it could be soil or where it could be, you know, some sort of a pest or disease. So I think those are some very key ones. And if you think about what I was talking about there, those are some of the ones that the first stages of integrated pest management. Um, but certainly the other thing that you've talked about, and I think everybody talked about, is this issue of ensuring that you get as much biodiversity as you can within your system and then that creates a much more stable ecosystem. So even if you do get some issues, um, certainly that can that can be better managed by the system rather than by you. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, just just wanting to thank Diana again. She has to scoot off at the moment, but thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and your time. Really appreciate it. Um, can I just reinforce the point that Rob was saying about monitoring? We're all saying monitoring is important. Yep. And it's, I can't think of too many people who would want to run a small business without keeping an eye on the books um, and not suddenly realise the bank's knocking at the door because they've they've been going down the tube slowly. So if growers are not monitoring, they, they won't know whether what they're doing is actually worthwhile, as in pest management um, activities. They also won't know what's happening out in the field, so they can't get pre-warned, pre-armed to take action. Um, they won't know how much biocontrol is going on out there and that sort of thing. And, and trying to run a production system without knowing those things is like flying in the dark. So monitoring exactly. monitoring is, is real key. In fact, you look at all these points, they're all real key things to do, which is why they're integrated into a package. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I think I've given an example before. I used to work in the, you know, vegetable seed production industry and, you know, we had, uh, you know, an expert integrated pest management um, company come in and they did all the monitoring for us and we got it to a point so for an example of a um, what was it red legged earth mite or um, and we, we worked out there was one period of time in the year where we could spray for it and that was the only spray um, just as they were increasing in numbers do that one spray we didn't have to spray again for the rest of the year so again it's yes it's using chemicals it's not ideal but it's one spray it's targeted and we don't have to follow that up um, Lee, yeah. Lee yeah. I, I make a comment to growers on a number of occasions. One well-targeted spray application is better than applying 15 uh, yeah. uh, ineffective sprays that are less well-targeted. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, I've got another question. Um, is there an attractant that can be used early in the spring for European wasps? They are easy to track and poison in autumn when they go backwards and forwards to their nest, but this is a little late. So is there a European wasps? Um, I guess, you know, from a agricultural perspective, they're probably more of an issue to human safety um, rather than a, a pest of agricultural crops. But 
I don't, I personally don't know. Do you know, David or Robert, if there's any? Well, there, are uh, certain, there are certainly traps out there that have attracted, you can get traps for, for flies, nuisance flies, and there are lures for European wasp as well. Yeah. So that's that's my extent of my knowledge on on trapping them. Yeah, I, I total aside. Um, one of the interesting things that people used to talk about was that European wasp was very attracted to beer, so yeah. they would actually get into beer cans, and yeah. that was a that was an issue. You know, when people were drinking outside of picnics or whatever, that they actually had European wasp that had actually got inside mm -hmm. the can, and it had actually sort of caused damage stung inside the throat and yeah uh, so you know I, I, I as i think david's right there are some things that i personally haven't ever used them um so i really don't know how effective they and are and i think it's the yeah. you know early in spring it isn't it a mated queen will go off and start a new nest so it is like the the attendee mentioned it is harder mm. to find when they're less active so you can't mm. pop them back yeah. to the nest so yeah. she's She's, you know, going off to find a new site away from the previous colony. Um, so, yeah, look, I'm sorry if we don't have a um, an exact answer for that, but um, good question. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, any any other, just coming up to the end of the presentation, any other comments you want to say, David or Robert? Oh, um, I'll just add one more, which, again, is the, the monitoring side of things. And yes. The other angle of it that... We we have examples in the in the arm industry where producers have have decided they will attempt to spray to to tackle caramoth or the beetle, and they've done that and monitored carefully. And at the end of the season, they acknowledged that they got no benefit whatsoever from a really kind of a application of pesticide applied as well as they possibly could with their gear. So monitoring that was really important for them because it basically said that was a waste of time and money and effort. Um, it's much better, obviously, or much nicer to get a result which said, hey, that's a fantastic result, and I'll do it again. But knowing that it did not work at all was really useful information for them. They only picked that up by monitoring carefully. Exactly. David, David that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. um, Lee, there's only just one other comment I'll make, and it follows on from um, the small hive beetle work. Yeah. Um, we are doing some work at the moment at Western Sydney with uh, endopathogenic nematodes. So, um, and we're looking at not only applying, as, as Diana was talking about, in the field, we're actually talking about whether or not we can apply in hive. And that makes it far more tricky because we've now got to look at how selective uh, the host is going to be in terms of a nematode. So we want something which is very effective against small hive beetle, but something which won't damage bees. Yeah. Yeah. And so and it, so it starts to fit in. It makes it very, very complex to start to fit all of these into, uh, as, as David was talking about, an overall system. There's a lot of science involved in IPM, Yeah, a lot of science. Yeah, and it's a lot of work and it's complex. Like you said, you know, with your diagrams, there's multifaceted approaches and this is, this is where the science comes in. It takes time. Mm -hmm. um, and look, just wrapping up, if, you, if anyone's interested in bee-friendly farming, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, just navigate to our website and you can apply. You can also be a bee friendly farming or bee friendly gardener. Um, uh, and if you're a honey beekeeper, you can be a bee friendly farming beekeeper or partner. Um, also uh, subscribe to our newsletter, uh, Weed Bee Foundation newsletter or bee friendly farming newsletter. Um, and if you want to donate, just navigate to Wayne Bee Foundation and you can, do as we are a registered charity, um and last of all yeah happy australian pollinator week there are still a few more um events uh, on the australian pollinator week uh website including uh the fantastic photography um um photo like the learning how to take photographs of bees that's on tomorrow so check that out um and yeah really thanks again for our speakers um someone else just said christy just said thank you very much for the webinar um, and for the pollinator guide. So uh, hi from Southern Tasmania. Yeah, you, I think there's a guide, um, Tas uh, there's a powerful pollinator guide for Southern Tassie. So thanks so much, Christy. Um, and yeah, everyone have a great day. And thank Australian you, Lee, for, for your role yep. as the coordinator. Too. <laughs> thanks. Yes, thanks so much, Lee. Oh yeah, and Candace. Thanks, Candace, who's, who's our and, tech And Candace, who's behind the scenes. <laughs> yes.